Hello everyone, welcome to today's message on our YouTube channel. My name is Chad Broom. I'm the pastor of the Trinity Bible Church in South Africa. And um, we've been studying a series together in the book of Acts. But today we take a break from that, probably actually till the, till the start of the new year. And the reason for that break is that now we're heading into a time of um, the Christmas season. And um, we'll be preparing for that. Um, and doing sermons um, in line of that, probably following some aspects of the Advent calendar starting on the 27th of November um, with the Thanksgiving service coming up for next weekend because it's a day of remembrance and we remember um, those that have fallen and fought in wars over the years and the cost to, to lives and we pray for those that have lost and we pray for those who serve. Um, that will be coming up on the 13th. That's next week. Um, so just bear those things in mind. But you're welcome to, to participate in any of the sermons on our YouTube channel. And uh, trust that the Lord will bless you um, abundantly. This morning's message is entitled From Bondage to Freedom. And we're simply going to look at um, Genesis chapter 3. Um, this explains the fall of man. Um, but it gives us some insight into the, the reality of the freedom that Adam and Eve enjoyed before the fall and then the bondage they were subsequently, um, uh, uh, that they subsequently entered into because of their sin and how that affects us who are born subsequent to the fall of man but born under the curse. Um, of that fall and so how do we move from bondage to freedom and essentially this is the gospel message and it's also a message that um, you will find very helpful as you prepare yourself um, perhaps to gather around the Lord's table and, and, and to remember Christ as you partake of the elements of bread and wine symbolizing the body of Christ and the blood that was shed in your place to pay the penalty for your sin and my sin, and also to, to wash us clean. Oh, the blood of Jesus that washes us whiter than the whitest snow. We are blessed because of Christ's sacrifice, and, um, and, we, and we need to learn how to embrace that and walk in the fullness of that freedom. If you've got your Bible, open up to Genesis chapter 3. I want to read to you from the, the, um, the NIV. And um, trust that God will speak to our hearts as we read his word together. May the Holy Spirit speak into your heart through the word of God right now. It's the Holy Spirit that takes the word of God and makes it alive to us. Impresses, impresses it upon our hearts and upon our minds so that we see the things spiritually that we ought to see. And the Bible says it's only the spiritual man, the man who's been made alive in Christ, who can see these spiritual things in the sense of understanding the spiritual truths um, that are revealed by God in Scripture. Um, the, the, those that don't yet know Jesus um, are dead to these things. They, they're not alive to these things. So let's read together and let's see what God has to say to us. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is, the, that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it. Or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good and was pleasing, it was good for food and it was pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom she took some and ate it she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate it then both the eyes sorry then the eyes of both of them were opened 
and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord, um, their God, as he was walking in the garden in the cool of day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to them, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. So I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me and I ate it. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit from the tree which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food, until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and he clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim, and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. Now the sermon is from bondage to freedom. But I want to start off with when freedom turns to bondage. That's our starting point here. When freedom turns to bondage. Okay, I'm just making a little note for myself as I do that. Um, so many people are, are willing to choose bondage in pursuit of what I call artificial freedom. They're willing to choose bondage when freedom turns to bondage. You see, the lure of artificial freedom is the lie of the devil that's been peddled since the dawn of time. It's an artificial freedom. You see, Genesis chapter 3 is the fall of man. Eve says, we may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden. We may eat from the fruit of the trees in the garden. We have freedom. That's what Eve says. And that's what the passage of Scripture said. If you have a look at the opening verses, the woman said to the servant in verse 2, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say we must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. We must not touch it or we will die. That's what he did say. So Eve makes it clear to the enemy, to the devil, who is trying to tempt her to eat the forbidden fruit. 
and he's tempting her with artificial freedom. Why? Because he says to her, you will surely not die. Now, that's the picture of the temptation. But right now, at this point, before the fall, they're free. Eve has made it clear. We may eat from the tree, the fruit of the trees in the garden. We have freedom in this place. We aren't bound. We've got a boundary, but we're not bound. We're not held hostage. We are given freedom, but we're given a guideline as well. Before sin, Adam and Eve were completely free. They were not enslaved to anything. Before sin. Freedom before sin was complete freedom. And all the enemy could offer, all the devil could offer, was artificial freedom. It didn't seem like artificial freedom to them. And for us looking back at the fall of man and the destruction that it has brought to us, we can see that it was only artificial freedom. It wasn't real. Artificial it's a fake. It's not the real freedom. They already had the real deal. They had the real freedom. And then sin introduces the artificial freedom which they discover is actually bondage. One rule, one rule made the freedom that Adam and Eve experienced real. So in order for them to understand and appreciate freedom, there was a rule. Do not eat of that one tree's fruit. That's forbidden. Don't eat from that tree's fruit. One rule shows they are living in freedom. They have freedom to choose. They have the freedom to make choices. You see, they have the freedom to choose to eat from all the trees they're allowed to eat from. Wonderful freedom. And they have the freedom to choose to eat from the tree they're not allowed to eat from. There was freedom. They had that freedom. And they exercised that freedom. But they introduced something when they exercised that freedom. Now this is the point. Some people might argue, well, then it wasn't freedom if, if they lost their freedom because they exercised their freedom. The point is this. They had freedom to appreciate and enjoy the presence of God and everything He provided. And they understood that freedom had a boundary or a guideline or a rule or a principle whereby they could enjoy God's freedom, but they could they could experience that freedom taken away if they chose to eat from the, for, for, from the forbidden tree. So they knew full well that their freedom was as they embraced what God said is good, what is wholesome, what is okay for you, and that their freedom would be given up. They would lose their freedom. The Bible says you will surely die. If you eat of that tree, you will die. That's what the Bible says. So they knew the boundary to their freedom. The thing that made their freedom real was knowing that they can't eat from that. Even though they have the freedom to choose that, they will not be choosing freedom the moment they choose it. They'll be choosing death. And they knew that. It was the command. It was clear. God made it clear. So the tree folks represented the expression of their freedom. They lived in a right relationship with God, in intimacy and closeness, a deep and beautiful friendship, while they made sure that they avoided that tree. They had the choice, life or death. That's the freedom. And it's spiritual death, by the way. It's not physical death. When they ate of the tree, they didn't die physically. They died spiritually. They were separated from God in that moment. They, they, they built a barrier up of separation. And technically speaking, their bodies then um, became bodies that 
<coughs> would not live forever. In other words, their bodies were no longer immortal. They would not live forever because they had sinned. But the real thing was their spiritual death. Okay. Separation from God. Now, they kept the blessing of freedom, all the blessings, the food, the relationship with God, the walking in the cool of the evening, the, 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 the intimacy with God, the friendship with God. They kept all of that when they obeyed the rule attached to freedom. They kept all of that. They broke the blessing the moment they chose the devil's artificial freedom. You see, the devil folks promised freedom and delivered death. He promised one thing, he delivered something else. But they knew the reality of it because they knew the rule. Don't eat from that tree or you will die. Now, the devil does that. The devil promised freedom. So let's have a look at why this was so attractive. What is it about artificial freedom that attracts us? What did the devil give him? Well, delightful forbidden fruit. Now they had access to it anyway, but it was the devil that, that put temptation in their way. It was the devil that started to, to say to them, look how good it looks. Look how good it looks. And, and Eve's comments were, it is pleasing to the eye. And when she starts to ponder on, on, on what she thinks will be the benefits. I mean, it's not just saying it's pleasing to the eye. If we look back at the passage, um, when, when he says, you will certainly not die, it says in verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food, pleasing to the eye and desirable for gaining wisdom, it was attractive. Fill the tummy. Okay, that, that was food. Fill the belly. It was appealing to the eye. Attractive from that sense. But also the idea, it would make me wise. She wanted it. And that was, that was what was an offer from the devil. Okay, that's what he said. This is what I can give you. Delightful forbidden fruit. Tasted good. Everyone wanted a piece of it. Everyone. And everyone was Adam and Eve. Because <laughs> that was everyone at that point. You see, Eve took and ate. And Adam did as well. It opened up another part of them they never knew. The moment they ate from that forbidden fruit. They instantly became aware of and ashamed of their nakedness. So what did the devil give them? Oh, he gave them delightful forbidden fruit. But he instantly introduced them to their shame and to their nakedness. And now they were afraid of God, so they hid. They hid. You see, what he gave them was spiritual death. He gave them forbidden fruit. And he gave them spiritual death, even though he offered them something more. He offered them something that he couldn't really give. He, he offers freedom. He offers a, a wealth of knowledge. He offered the ability to be like God, and he gave them death. So he gives them delightful forbidden fruit, and he gives them spiritual death. That's what he gives. Now, how is that? That's a, that's a freedom that doesn't compare to what God had already given them. Now, you and I, folks, are born under the second condition, the second benefit that they derived from the devil. Spiritual death entered the world as a result of their sin. You and I are born under this condition. Now, compare the freedom they had with what they lost by one single act of disobedience. Think about it. One single act of disobedience... And they lost the freedom that they were given. The freedom to enjoy intimacy with God. The freedom to have a relationship with God where they were not afraid of God. They, they were friends of God. 
the freedom, they felt no shame with their nakedness. They could eat of the fruits they were provided for in every way. And they were mortal beings. They were immortal beings in the sense that at this point death had not entered the world um, or creation in any shape or form. So now, one moment of falling for the lie. And in verse 7 it says they realized they were naked. They discovered this thing called shame. Verse 9 says they became afraid of God. And afraid and ashamed at the same time of their nakedness. But they knew they had done wrong. They knew they had done wrong. Because instantly something changed. They could already feel the consequences of their actions in their own nakedness. In their own sudden fear that God's coming, we must hide. Fear crept in. Fear had never been there before. They had no reason to fear. When they lived in the freedom God provided. They now hid from the one they loved spending time with in the past. They loved spending time with God. And now they were hiding from Him. They lost their innocence. And they lost their intimacy with God. They also became liars. In that moment... We have instantly Adam blaming Eve, Eve blaming the serpent. We have this blame game and they became liars. They were not willing to take responsibility for their actions and they blamed others. And they set into motion the way man works. Sinful man works. Sinful man doesn't like taking responsibility for his own actions, particularly those that results in spiritual death. See how quickly and how instantaneously this sin affected and infected their personal relationships with each other and with God. It was crazy. Sin introduces ugliness into everything. You see, to the woman, he said, you will now experience pains in childbearing. It will be very severe. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. There will be this, this tension going on because of things now. Where there was peace before. Where there was freedom and joy and love and intimacy. It's now been marred. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the fruit of the tree, cursed is the ground because of you. Here's a curse that comes upon the ground. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the day of your life. Folks, by the sweat of our brow, it doesn't come easy anymore. You can't just walk to those lovely trees that were provided and pick the fruit. All the amazing provision that was made for them in the Garden of Eden when they walked in freedom and they obeyed the rule, don't eat from that fruit. It's all gone now. Now there's pain. Now there's suffering. Now there's hardship. Now there are thistles and thorns. Now it's the sweat of your brow. And one day you will, your body will return to the dust of the earth from which we, you were taken. You see, folks... It is because of this very act of trading the blessing of freedom for the curse of bondage that, that we as the Christian church regularly gather around the Lord's table. It's because of this very act of trading the blessing of freedom for the curse of bondage. That we gather around this table of communion. Because this table of communion represents restoration of that blessing of freedom. As we gather around the Lord's table in a time of remembrance about what Jesus has done for us. His broken body and his shed blood on the cross where he paid the penalty for our sins. This table now represents the restoration of the blessing of freedom. They enjoyed the blessing of freedom in the Garden of Eden before they sinned. 
And they lived under the curse after they sinned. The curse of sin because of the fall of man. In Jesus, we find the curse reversed. In Jesus, we find restoration and Him pouring blessing back into our lives and freedom is restored. This table, as we gather around communion, is the picture of the chains of bondage to sin being shattered. This table is a picture of our relationship with God being restored to its original intimacy, closeness, to a deep and beautiful relationship. Just like Adam and Eve had when they walked in the Garden of Eden with their God, with their Lord, with their friend. And they were unafraid and unashamed. And they had pure intimacy with God. Deep friendship. Heartfelt friendship with the creator of the world. Uncontaminated friendship. Friendship not marred by anything. And through Christ, we have the restoration of that freedom. Through Christ, we are drawn back into a relationship with God that is based on freedom. Freedom to access the throne of God. Freedom to be called friends of God. Freedom to live for God. Freedom to worship Him. Freedom because our sin has been dealt with. The shame of our sin has been removed. The guilt of our sin has been dealt with. The price of our sin has been paid. Yes, folks. Friendship with God is the result of faith in Jesus the Savior. And it's Jesus the Savior that allows us who were born under the curse to move from bondage to freedom and to start to experience and get a taste of what Adam and Eve had in the Garden of Eden before the fall of man. And one day, we will taste of that in all its fullness when we enter into God's glory in heaven. When we come into the celestial city and we live with our creator God forevermore. That day is coming where freedom will be the same as it was in the Garden of Eden. And there will be no more crying or pain or hardship or toil or suffering. It will be gone. And we partake of that now, folks. We start that journey now. We move from bondage to freedom now. If we don't do that now while we're alive on this earth, we will not experience the freedom in heaven. Because unless we bow our knee to Jesus in this life, it will be too late for us to try and bow the knee in a future life. It's, this is the opportunity. This is the chance we're given in life. And when this body dies, the opportunity to make amends, to confess my sin, to repent and to turn to Jesus is gone. The opportunity dies when I die. So while you are alive, you need to turn to God through his son Jesus. From bondage to freedom is what Jesus offers you. I pray that you would take up that option. And you would say, yes, Lord Jesus, I want that freedom. I don't want the sin in my life to curse me to, 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 to eternal hell, to damn me to eternal hell. I want, I want the love of God to restore me through Jesus back into a relationship with the Father. And Jesus is the only way to restore us to the Father. The Bible makes it amply clear in John chapter 14. It says, Jesus speaking, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Folks, you want a resurrected life. You want eternal life. You have to come to Jesus. You have to bow before him. You have to repent of your sins. You have to turn your heart over to Jesus. And the moment you make that decision to do that, you've exercised a choice in freedom. True freedom. Not the kind of freedom the enemy offers. As I said to you, his freedom is, is a conditional freedom. It's an artificial freedom. It's not real. It's always a lie. It's always got barbs and hooks and stings and death in it. 
But the freedom Jesus offers you is eternal. And it's peace with God. Oh, that you would gain the peace of God and be at peace with God through the wonderful gift and sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Accept that, folks. And you can be assured that you're going to heaven one day. God will transform your heart and your mind. He will bring change into your life. And He will start to transform you more and more into the likeness of Christ. Oh, that we would become more like Jesus, our Savior. Let's pray. Father God, I pray for each person as they've just once again been reminded of the freedom we had as mankind before the fall. The bondage we came under because of the fall. But the freedom that we discover in Christ. Oh, we thank you for the love of Jesus. For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son into this world to die for us sinners so that we could be set free. He came to give us life, abundant life, eternal life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We love you and we appreciate what you've done for us. And to all those people who don't yet know Jesus, take this opportunity to bow before him and cry out to Jesus and, and tell him and ask him to have mercy upon you as a sinner and turn your heart and your life over to him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you folks. Have a wonderful week.